Um, so uh, this morning I did a presentation about uh, making your own languages with Racket and about how it could be useful for creating data structures and data languages that are uh, useful in a specific domain. And uh, this afternoon I wanted to take a bit more time to, uh, to make you try by yourselves uh, making a language. So um, I wanted this session to be a bit more interactive and so if you have um, working computers you can try live and, uh, and see if you can do something. Um, the, um, the code is on this repository on GitHub uh, at eme slash fosdem 2019 talk and there's a workshop uh, directory. So if you pull that, um, that repository you, and of course you also need to install Racket. Um, it should be in, uh, in all the, the good um, package repositories around there. Um, you, um, you can get to, uh, to this file uh, once you pull it and, um, and we'll see how we can make our own language. Um, the first thing you usually do when you create a language, um, I, show, I have already shown those lines this morning, so um, this is the most simple way to create um, a language in Racket. The, the way it works is Racket has modules, and every time you import a module, it ex executes some code uh, on this module uh, before importing it into your, uh, your runtime environment and running it. And uh, during this time, you have the um, ability to um, read the code you are importing and modify it on the fly before it arrives into your, um, into your code, your running code. So um, the, the way it works is that any racket module you create, you just create a file and um, by itself it, it can be used as a, a reader for other modules. Um, so any racket file have the ability to read over racket files. Um, and this is the, the kind of, uh, of module you want to make. So there's, um, the, the magic is happening here. Um, this function, it, it's actually a, a macro, but um, uh, so this macro is, um, is the macro that is being called when you import a module. And uh, in this file, we're going to change it so that it does what we want. So um, we are modifying the standard way Racket works by putting our own code into this function. So the way it works is we, we just rename uh, the function while we provide it. So um, providing a module is the inverse of importing it. Um, importing a module is done with require. You, you just say, okay, for, for this module, I need, I need this, I need this, I need this. Um, and providing is the opposite. So it declares all, the, mod all the, the functions and the stuff you create in your file and you want other um, over files to use. So um, if you provide something that already, already exists, it's going to be replaced by the one you provided. So here we uh, create our own module begin and we provide it as this name. So it's going to replace it into the, the environment. And um, the module begin we write is really simple. It's like only those lines. Um, it's just, this is the way to, def to declare a macro in Racket and in Scheme. Um, so we declare a macro that is called module begin and takes an expression as an argument. And we call the actual, the, the real module begin uh, with our own code here. So uh, this is the part where we, 
uh, we change the way module begin works is uh, we, we just call the old module begin with our code. And the code is doing only one thing. Um, it just provides some variable that I call the wrench. Uh, uh, yep. So there you go. Um, you got it? Okay. So it just takes the expression that is inside the module and puts it into a variable and provides the variable. Um, what's happening here exactly is uh, I'm going to show you uh, interactively in a moment, is that um, the, the data file I want to um, process is this one. Um, so this is, the, um, this is an example of a simple language uh, I just made. Uh, I designed this language so that you can create a ranch and have ponies in it and uh, describe the battle cries of every pony. And so... Um, this code is going to generate some uh, function that I can call. So uh, I'm calling them just right there. You just call the ranch and you give them the name of the pony and it should print their battle cries. So uh, if I do this just there, uh, I call racket on my main file. And as you see, the, they, they're just crying out loud uh, well, what they want. So um, the, the way it works is that I want to take this data and transform it into actual code. Um, <coughs> the easy way to do that is through a macro. So I just match for, uh, I, I just create, for this example, I create only one macro, the ranch macro. And so the ranch macro is going to run and analyze stuff in there and generate some code. And it happens uh, just there. Uh, the macro is there. So I define a macro called branch that takes a syntax. And so this part is uh, a bit um, hairy, but uh, you, you get used to it when you work with a syntax parse. Um, <coughs> the macro can have two um, keywords. Uh, ponies and pony, every time it, it stumbles upon one of those keywords, it just doesn't care. It's just there for, um, uh, as, a, as an information that, okay, we are in this structure, this is the pony section, that's it. And the way it pattern matches the, the data we saw is there. It looks out for... Um, a section called ponies in which there are any number, this is any number, the, the three dots there, uh, any number of the sec uh, section starting with pony, then a name as an ID, and a battle cry as a string. So um, <coughs> this line here describes the structure of our data. Uh, if we can look at our data again, we have a structure starting with ponies and then any number of structures starting with pony. So here we start with ponies and any number of this stuff. And we want to replace that. Can you speak a little more loudly? Oh, yeah, sorry. <coughs> and you want to replace that with uh, code. So uh, the replacement part is happening just there. Uh, I just create a function that takes a pony name and switches over it. And if it equals um, the pony we just met, then it returns the cry. Otherwise, uh, this pony does not exist. And we'll be able to see in real time, what this macro is doing step by step using a very handy tool, which is called the macro stepper. 
And if I step, it's going to open up. Yeah. So <clears throat> this tool uh, allows us to see in real time uh, the macro over the code. Uh, if I step, it's going to define a module. It's going to define some stuff for the racket system. And then at one time, it's going to reach our code. Uh, uh, uh. And there. OK. So um, this is before the, the macro hits, and this is after. And we can see that it transforms um, <coughs> our structure into a lambda with a cond and uh, an if statement for every, um, every pony in the, in the data structure. So um, in C or C++, this would be really efficient because you're transforming a data structure into um, actual code with uh, direct inlining of the data. Uh, here, the, um, the condition is directly in line for every, uh, every piece of data. So you actually generate code and a big if. And it happens that the cond keyword is actually a macro. So if I step a little bit further, we're going to see the cond macro transforming our code into if statements. So um, here, the cond defined into, uh, into racket is transformed into uh, a bunch of uh, if. So once this is compiled into actual uh, binary, it's extremely efficient. It's not, uh, it's not data. It, it became code. It became compiled code. Um, and so when I discovered this, I thought, wow, uh, this is like the, um, the best advancement we have in uh, data-oriented programming, uh, uh, programming systems. It's like we can write data and have actual code at the end without anything in between. It's like your data is your code. And uh, so I started to, um, to look at how I could create languages for, for my needs. And so uh, that's why I'm doing this talk right now. It's because I thought it was really exciting to um, um, just write, uh, just express what you want from the program, from a data point of view, and get actual code uh, in the end. <coughs> so um, this is the... Um, the, the trickiest part to understand is the, the macro here. But there's a lot of resources on the internet uh, from other uh, racket programmers. Um, there's one that is Greg Hendershot. He has a really great blog about uh, writing macros in racket. So um, you should really check that out. Um, and uh, at first, I thought I would stop there and make everyone try this kind of stuff. But um, four minutes before the, uh, the talk started, I got something else working. Um, here, so the, I just one question. yeah. So I'm trying to run the, uh, the branch file. Yeah. Um, and uh, when I when I just run racket and then ranch the RCT. Uh, it comes up with the uh, standard module name resolver flex dot bound. So, uh, is there a list of dependencies that I need to install to get it to run? Or um, it seems like it's just missing packages. It, it seems you might or be missing packages. Like package. Some kind of like require patch. Is it you got like an environment variable set? Like um, maybe. Can you repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, so, you have an issue with um, uh, just running the the branch the RKT. Yeah. So Basically, it's missing some modules, and uh, there's no like module list in the GitHub repo. So I'm just wondering if we're if there's some 
dependency that you're using that are, that are like already installed on your machine but won't be on ours? Mm, okay, so he's wondering if there are any dependencies uh, missing. It's fine, it's fine. I don't want to derail anything. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I, I thought I was I was using known, but um, maybe I'll I'll check that out uh, later. Yeah. If you open the wrench dot record file, yeah. then you change the first line. Yeah. Uh, instead of uh, virtual slash blah blah blah, oh, you give the file name. You can press that space. Ah. Oh yeah, that will work. Yeah. Um, and so, um, right now, the, the language we created uh, looks like S expressions. So it's the standard um, way of uh, writing Lisp um, the languages. It's just parentheses everywhere and um, uh, atoms between uh, between them. And uh, Racket can go further and provide you. For, here I'm using uh, the default SX reader, but you can actually use any reader you like. You can create your own readers for syntaxes that are not S expressions. And so um, I created another example that um, the other example requires um, dependencies, external dependencies. Um, I changed the language into that. Uh, this is completely arbitrary. I could have used any um, uh, any way of writing this. I, I just thought it was cool that way. Um, so if I want my language to uh, look like this, and then make it so that it generates this, then generates the code we saw, uh, there's a step further. We can write um, a reader and a parser. Um, the, the thing we wrote right now was the expander. So the expander is using macros to expand the code into uh, bigger uh, stuff, the bigger functions, uh, as we saw in the macro stepper. <coughs> but there's other layers, and one of the layer is uh, the parser. And there's actually a language called brag, which, is, uh, which I'm using here. And this language allows you to um, define um, a syntax for a language and use that, that syntax uh, as a parser for your language. So here, I wrote um, a syntax. And so I wrote that a range can be uh, an optional new line, then uh, a marker for range begin, then a new line, then a number of ponies, then uh, this is yeah. This is a typo. Uh, then ranch end, then new line, and then ponies is a uh, any number of pony, and pony is any number of spaces, then extra extra. <coughs> and so this syntax um, is actually a racket language, and this gets uh, processed and transformed into a parser, and. Uh, it generates uh, exactly what we saw there. It generates this kind of stuff. And the way it works is we have to, begin, we have to define what range begin is as a token, what pony begin is. And so it is done in the reader. And so the reader uh, overwrites another part of racket. Uh, instead of overwriting module begin, we overwrite two other functions, read and read syntax. And those two functions are called when you actually read uh, something from a file, when you import it. And so you can define read syntax to be um, a parser. And uh, here what I'm doing is, so this is the parser I defined. When this gets compiled, it is compiled into uh, a function called parser, uh, called parse. And in the reader, I require it, so I get parse. And as you can see, uh, we can uh, visualize the, uh, the dependency. So parse is coming from this parser. And so I can call this function <coughs> to generate tokens from, uh, 
from my, uh, my file here. And I define the tokens here using a lexer. Um, this is a new line. So I defined that every time it's, it finds this character, it generates a token that is a new line. Every time it finds this uh, suite of characters, then this is a round begin. Every time it finds this, this is a round end. Every time it finds uh, two characters that are alphabetic, two or more characters that are alphabetic, this is an ID. And anything from uh, double quote to double quote is a string. <coughs> and so by defining your tokens there, <coughs> you can then use them here to define what the syntax of the language here is. And it will take this and process it into this. So this is a really powerful um, system that uh, allows you to, to define anything you want, uh, any language you want. Um, do you have any, any questions about what's going on, or is it OK? In the second file, where are you referencing the expander? Um, here. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, is the, the pony language uh, saying that it is going to use a kind of standard? Yeah, so here what I'm doing is. Um, Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. So um, how am I uh, using the, the parser here? Uh, how, are you, how am I re requiring it? Um, so uh, one of the issues with the um, bang lang uh, syntax is that it allows, uh, I, I cannot put directly um, something li like that. Uh, let's say uh, my, my, uh, my reader dot uh, um, It doesn't work like that. It, uh, only actual modules are authorized here. So I need to create an, an actual module. And <coughs> I make it here. Uh, let's see. OK, uh, so this file is just declaring that the reader is uh, workshop slash reader. And so workshop slash reader is uh, our reader here. So um, the, the way it works is it just, you, you just have to define a special module that is called a reader. This is um, something a bit specific that I um, I had a lot of difficulties working with this uh, at first. That's why I'm uh, showing this as an example right here. And uh, uh, I hope a lot of people trying to do this will uh, not have to struggle with this as I struggled. Um, but uh, yeah, right now I declare that the, um, uh, the module pony, when I require it, when I use it, uh, the reader is going to be my reader. That's it. Um, so uh, this is all I can show you about uh, this pony language. But I have, uh, so I made a lot of other language if you want some examples, um, <coughs> more complex ones. Um, and I encourage you to uh, take this example and push, push it further and make your own language out of it. You're, you're free. Yes, there's a question. Uh, yes, I tried it. So yeah, I'm going to repeat the question. Sorry. Um, how, is it is it possible to create some indent, indentation based uh, languages like Python, for example? Uh, so I tried it, and it's actually possible, but it's a bit complicated because um, uh, Bragg, as I showed here, will not be enough because um, indent indentation-based um, languages are not regular uh, grammars. Um, 
they cannot be computed using the kind of grammar I showed here. Uh, you need um, a recursive grammar. And uh, you need to keep the state of what is the number of indentation. And um, this is, so this is getting a bit more complicated. It's possible, but it's more complicated than the example I got there. Um, so uh, one of the languages I made with this uh, was, uh, it's one of the first languages I made with this was a language for uh, generating emulators um, from <coughs> a CPU description. So you just describe what the CPU is, what are the operations, and it generates an emulator. Uh, I called it virtual MPU, and uh, let me see. Um, I'm going to show one of the one of the files. Uh, let's see. So this is the the kind of file you can create with with this language. You declare um, an MPU. You declare a name. Then you declare the, the registers. Uh, OK, so vCPU has an A register, a B register, a status register, uh, the, um, uh, the stack pointer register is 16 bits, stuff like that. Uh, you can precise, uh, you, you can declare that the, the status register is SR and that all the bits mean this. So there's one bit that means it's the carry, one that is the overflow, etc., etc. You declare the interrupts, and then you declare all the operations. <coughs> and uh, I made my own um, somewhat macro system inside this operation stuff. The operations are, are starting here with the branches. So those are the, the, the different style, the different kind of branches in the, in the emulator. Um, then the moves, load A, load B, load uh, stack pointer, uh, there stack manipulations, math, add A plus B, stuff like that. And some of them required, um, uh, some of them have had exactly the same way of working for a lot of stuff. So I made macros. Uh, for example, there, subtraction, addition. Uh, and you can declare them uh, on the top. So here, uh, subtraction and additions are described here. You just say that you want a result. You want the result of adding uh, those together. And then you, you change the carry. You change the half carry. You change the overflow. You, you, you do a bunch of stuff inside the, the, uh, the CPU and you get your result. Uh, so this is an example of the, the kind of um, uh, language you can make. Uh, I s in this one, I prefer to use S expressions and not a, a special uh, language. But um, I also did, in this same project, I also did another um, um, another language which is actually an assembler. And so I created a language that passes uh, assembly language. So this time, I needed a, a special reader and stuff like that. But uh, this code right here is, is passed and transformed into an S expression and transformed into uh, racket functions and then executed. And it's just uh, assembly language at first. Um, so for this one, the reader looks like this. Um, there's like those tokens. Um, there's like a token for uh, numbers. So numbers can have a dollar before them. They can be um, in, a, in hexadecimal format. Um, there's like, uh, there's comments. So there's comments with a, a semicolon um, and, and stuff like that. 
there, there's a special section for data. You can put uh, data in there and stuff like that. And the uh, parser looks like this. So an assembly is just uh, lines, uh, any number of lines bit and new lines between. And then a line is, can be an instruction or an assignment or data declaration. Uh, an instruction has a tag, an optional tag, then any number of space, a mnemonic, then any number of space and operands and stuff like that. So it's, it's like 20 lines and it parses assembly language. Um, and it, it took me, uh, I've been working on this project for maybe one month and I knew nothing about how Bragg works uh, before. And I just learned uh, how it worked. And in, in 20 lines of, of code, you can, uh, you can generate a, a parser for, for assembly language. Um, what can I say? Yeah. Uh, would it actually be uh, expanding into like the assembler that you expand into bracket code that do what? Um, so right now it's assembled, uh, it's expanded into um, binary. <coughs> so the, the way it works is um, it passes the assembly, um, the assembly and then um, generates opcodes for all the assembly stuff and then uh, put that into a file. And so it compiles a binary. And I, I put it there, multiple options. You can generate uh, the Motorola um, uh, SREC uh, format or um, the, um, uh, the Intel format or stuff like that, or direct binary or stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a working assembler. Uh, for the for the CPU, I want I wanted to emulate. Uh, can I like try to stand so bracket? So I was I was in the first of all. So yeah. I, I was trying to catch up. Bracket is like a, a variant of Lisp, uh, which so. is defining your own language. So and yeah, bracket is a is a, a Lisp language from the Scheme family, uh, which allows you to define your own language. Uh, so you are now defining your own parsers for a specific language, in this case assembler. You're parsing it and you combine it to what? So uh, he's wondering how uh, I'm, I'm generating racket code, but how uh, does it compile to something else after that? Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, I think I can show the uh, the expander. Um, <coughs> so, da, 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 um, uh, I'm going to show up the um, uh, 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 Future MPU. Uh, the, f the interesting file here would be there. Okay, the assembler. Uh, okay. Um, so it is compiled into uh, structures, racket structures. So uh, the it's, it's yeah. Compiled into racket language. yeah. So at first it compiles into racket language, and then when the racket language executes, it generates a binary. The binary is on, runs on Java virtual machine like this. Uh, it generates a binary uh, and from the assembler. Yeah, like uh, the assembler, uh, the assembly language is assembled into a binary, yeah. so that it works on the target machine I wanted it to to work. So what I'm doing is I'm generating code that is executed uh, to do what I want. 
instead of just executing some code, I'm generating code and then it executes. So I parse the assembly into a racket structure. Then the racket structure is parsed into racket code. Then the racket code is executed. And the, the main function of that execution is write to a file. The, 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 first, the first function that is called is write this to a file. And then uh, everything else is the, the data that I scrambled and uh, mashed together. Um, I could have written, uh, I mean, it's a way to write um, an assembler. I could, I could have written an assembler in any language. Um, but the way it works in, uh, in Racket is interesting because uh, you define your program as a language instead of just a program. So um, uh, instead of saying, OK, I wrote this assembler, you just run it on some code, and then you get a binary. Uh, I say, I wrote a language that is actually an assembling language. And so when you use it, you assemble into binary. So uh, it's, it's a bit like um, changing your, the way you think about programs. Instead of using programs, uh, you create languages, and you use those languages. It's the way Racket promotes. Any other questions? So what's the benefit doing this? Um, one of the things I like with this is that uh, you define, um, instead of thinking in terms of, I need this program that handles this data this way, uh, instead of thinking into pipes that you put together uh, to achieve a result, you think into, uh, how can I best describe my problem? How can I best describe my issue? What is the thing that I want to do, and how can I describe it so that it's obvious when you read the code what you, what you want to do? And so um, Racket allows you to um, open a file and say, OK, so my problem is about uh, bakeries. I, I want to I wanna generate, uh, I want to uh, sell bread and uh, croissant and stuff like that. So uh, I have a bakery, and it says uh, it says a lot of, of stuff. So uh, it has products, and uh, there's like uh, a croissant, and there's like uh, uh, bread and uh, baguette and stuff. And um, and you start by thinking about your data, and then you make it so that this data is actually executed. It's actually a program and uh, actually makes what you want. So, um, so the benefit I find is that um, instead of thinking about uh, making programs that takes data and output something, you, you just write your data the best way you want your data to look, and then it executes into something. And that's what I found uh, a bit magical about, uh, about this, this way of working is that uh, it redefines the way you, you program. You, you don't, um, it, it changed a bit my, my way of uh, seeing programming and, um, and languages in general. Um, uh, I don't have to think about, OK, in Python, there are those kind of data structures that I need to use. Or uh, I remember with my colleagues, we had really long talks about we should using this kind of classes, and then this class inherits this class, and then uh, it generates this, um, uh, th there's this interface, and uh, we need to change the, the interface so that uh, this customer can uh, work correctly with the interface, and this class interacts with this class. And we had, um, um, it forges the, the way you think about programming is y you have tools around, you have, okay, I'm working with C Sharp, for example. You have you have classes. You have um, um, you have reflection. You have a, lo a lot of tools around. But having only those tools in your hands, you only think 
uh, about how to use those tools. You only think, um, the, the, the only way you, you think about resolving your problem is using those tools. So um, uh, if instead of thinking in terms of tools, we think in terms of what is the actual problem and the data that uh, I want to process and um, what do I really want to do, um, you write the language that gives you the best tools for this task. And this could be a different language depending on, uh, on the domain. Yes? So you still have to write the tools to translate uh, your your data into actions. And uh, what I like is that the way you write the tools is through a language. So um, they are not just tools. They are a language that you can make evolve and uh, that you can document, that you can um, um, write specification for that language and that you can share with colleagues and that you can promote and that um, is adapted to uh, your company and the, the product you're working on and the clients. And um, uh, it's, it, it doesn't change the way, it doesn't change completely the way we work. We, we still write tools and those tools are executed so that uh, uh, we, we, get, uh, we get what we want. But um, instead of having some executables that no one knows how it works in a shady uh, place in your repository that no one touched for 10 years, and there's no documentation for that, and um, uh, c can you change it so that it, uh, it handles the new stuff that just came around? And you look at this legacy code and you're like, okay, it's, it's not going to make it. I'm going to need to rewrite this from scratch. And instead, if you have a language, um, yes, you will need to change it. You will need to adapt it. You will need to um, modify the way it works to adapt to uh, the, the situation. But uh, it's a complete language. It's not just tools around. And so it has consistency it has uh, a logic behind and that's what I like anyone uh, want to try racket now <laughs> raise your hand <laughs> great <laughs> so how do you strike it in your work um, I mostly use racket in my free time because uh, uh, in real life, I'm actually doing JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, actually, I'm doing something that is in relation between JavaScript and Racket uh, recently. Uh, I've been working on a project that has been started by uh, a student at the University of uh, uh, at the MIT. And he's been working with Racket a lot, and he's, he has written a lot of um, theses about, uh, about a lot of stuff in Racket. And for his PhD, he invented a language that generates JavaScript from Racket. And um, this language is really interesting. It's called Erlang. There. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> and so this uh, this language uh, uses racket and generates uh, actual JavaScript so vi this is how it looks so uh, you write something like that and it generates this kind of stuff and this is really interesting because this um, this is similar to the work of uh, the team at Babel, uh, the, the way Babel works is that it generates, it's a, a generator for JavaScript, and it parses the, the syntax of JavaScript, and it understands what you need, what you want from your JavaScript code, and it transforms it into other JavaScript code that runs on any browser. And Babel is an awesome project, an awesome open source project. And um, this is the kind of stuff that uh, 
allows to do the, the same thing as Babel, but uh, using the power of macros in Racket. So uh, everything here um, can be used as data, can be parsed, can be modified, can be analyzed, so that you can generate different JavaScript depending on the situation, so that you can uh, generate uh, JavaScript depending on the browser or stuff like that. Um, and it happens that uh, the Babel project has a system called macros that they wrote by, from scratch by hand, and uh, it works mostly the same as Racket. Um, th the only difference is that, well, Babel is like uh, a really big open source project with a lot of um, contributors, so it's way, way more developed and there's a l way more features. But um, one interesting thing is that using Racket here, you don't have only access to uh, the macros defined as Babel defined them. You have access to all the Racket environment and all, all the other languages. So um, one of the things I was showing in my talk this morning uh, was an example from a language I'm making. Um, oops. So this was my talk this morning, and uh, there. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it a bit smaller. Uh, oopsie. Okay. Um, and. This is an example from, this is something that I try to achieve. It's not ready yet, but uh, I'm trying to make something like this. I'm trying to make a system in which you can write uh, API servers, uh, web servers, and this is, for example, a response from, uh, from an API. And instead, inside you have uh, code that fetches in the database, you have code that generates HTML, you have code that generates CSS, you have code that generates JavaScript. Everything in the same syntax and in the same function. So um, you just focus on writing uh, your complete website as, as, as a data, as, as function, as just one function, and then uh, it generates everything. It generates JavaScript, generates the CSS. For example, um, the, the style um, the, the, the style um, system here could be a, a system like less so that you can have uh, variables inside your style and uh, uh, generate your style dynamically um, and the same thing for the, the JavaScript part it could be something like Babel uh, so I'm trying to, using, I'm trying to use uh, Erlang in, inside this part there so uh, I generate JavaScript, but inside the JavaScript you can put uh, some data. You, you can uh, uh, modify the, and generate some JavaScript code and stuff like that. So this is the kind of way of programming I'm trying to, um, I'm exploring, and I'm trying to see where it goes. But um, I, I think it, it's kind of cool to be able to forget that there are different languages and just just write in in one languages in one language uh, with a lot of syntaxes to generate bits and bits from uh, from the server. Um, it can be, sometimes it can be. Um, uh, I know uh, some people in the Racket uh, community that are working on uh, that, that kind of, uh, of structures with uh, cycles inside and stuff like that. Um, the, um, 
the, the racket parser and the racket expander and the, the macro system is extremely uh, powerful, so um, uh, it handles the, the cycles and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know in, in details. There, there are like uh, people with PhDs that would be way more able to answer this question. <laughs> but um, yes, it, it can handle data structures with cycles and stuff like that. Uh, but I guess it would be a bit more complicated and you will face some, some issues. Um, if nobody has any other questions, I, I think I'm done.